Hi everybody, it's Miss V. Hope you're having a great day and that you're ready for another class in science. So for the past couple of days, we've been talking about different nutrients or elements like carbon and oxygen and how they're important to sustaining life on this planet. We have to have the elements like carbon and oxygen so that we can breathe and we can cycle energy through our system. And it's really important that we know how that element is properly cycled in our ecosystem and how to regulate that. Now, one thing we didn't talk about is the bad nutrients. There's also different elements that are not good for our bodies, and they also get cycled through our system. Now, the two fancy words that we are going to be learning today in relation to this are bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Now, they do sound very similar. However, there are some distinct dif differences between the two. So as we go through the notes, make sure you're listening in for bioaccumulation and biomagnification so that you can tell the difference. Now, in order to talk about these, we're kind of going to go back to basics for a minute. We now know that energy and nutrients can move through a food chain or a food web from producers to consumers, meaning that my producer, like my tree down here, is going to harness energy from the sun and make glucose molecules that then my rhino and my giraffe up here can consume and gain those energy molecules and then transfer those to a lion who eats them next. It's important to remember that when we're drawing our food webs that we always put the arrow pointing towards the one who is gaining the energy or gaining the nutrients. However, like I said before, we haven't really talked about toxins and how those also get cycled through our system. So I want you to brainstorm for me just for a minute. What are some chemicals that are bad for the environment or for organisms? You may be thinking right now of some things that are on the periodic table of elements. Go ahead and ask a parent or a sibling if you're needing some help. All right, now if you'd like to brainstorm some more, feel free to pause this video. However, we are going to talk about a few different chemicals that are fairly well known and have some negative impacts on our bodies. The first one we're going to mention is lead. Now lead was used in house paint and water pipes and pencils until around the 1960s. It was very popular, no one had an issue with it until we started seeing symptoms of lead poisoning. Now these include developmental delays, irritability, slug sluggishness and fatigue, as well as many others. Now you may still think that we use lead in our pencils to this day, but we do not. We actually use a different compound called graphite, which is just a simplified form of carbon. However, a lot of people still do call it lead. We also used to use lead in house paint and water pipes. So it's important that if your home was built before the 1960s, that you double check and make sure that you either repainted your house or you've double checked that the pipes are not made out of lead because these are things that can slowly add little bits of lead into your system. Another toxin that you may not be as familiar with is called DDT. Now DDT was a chemical insecticide or an insect killer that was very popular up until the 1970s. We commonly use this to spray crops and even people in order to get rid of insects. And you might be thinking, okay, well, why would we spray people with an insecticide? It was actually very, very effective for getting rid of lice. So you can actually find pictures online of people spraying one another with DDT. Now, after a while, they found out that DDT is not very good for humans or other animals in high dosages. There was many symptoms of different cancers, male infertility, as well as miscarriages among the human population, as well as animals. Another interesting impact was the one that it had on our large animals of prey, particularly our birds like bald eagles. This was the reason for the 
big population crash of the bald eagles in the United States because DDT was actually thinning their eggshells. So as the birds wanted to go sit on them, they would actually break, causing them to not have any offspring. Now DDT has since in the 70s been banned and you cannot use it anymore. So that's a good thing. However, it's still important to recognize how these chemicals impact our environment. The last one we're going to talk about is mercury. Mercury is a naturally occurring element found in air, water, and soil. And it's highly toxic when in a form called methylmercury. And this is really commonly taken up by fish, shellfish, and animals that then eat those fish. I have a picture over here showing you different animal, different fish in particular, and their relative levels of mercury. So as we're eating trout and salmon and haddock, they have a very low amount of mercury. You can eat them in high levels and it's fairly safe. Now the medium level fish, we do have to be careful with how much we eat. So you should not be eating mahi-mahi every day, as well as tuna and striped bass. Now, the high concentration fish like swordfish and shark and king mackerel are fish that you definitely want to be cautious when eating and how frequently you do so. I don't know about you, but I don't eat shark or swordfish very often, so, or at all. <laughs> so I don't really have to worry about those. However, I do wanna make sure that my tuna consumption, as well as maybe my salmon and my trout consumption is observed and monitored. Now, some symptoms of mercury poisoning is vision loss, numbness, impairment of speech, walking, and even hearing. So these are some very serious symptoms that can last for an individual's entire lifetime. In fact, there have been regions, such as regions in Japan in the past, that have had high doses of mercury, and entire towns have been impacted by mercury poisoning and they called it Minamata disease. And this is still happening to this day in different regions when they see large amounts of mercury being dumped into the water. Now, this is an image actually showing you how much canned tuna you can safely eat within a week, according to your body weight and according to the approximate levels of mercury in different types of tuna. So if I were eating light tuna, let's say I'm about 120 pounds. If I'm eating light tuna, which is the light bar right here, it means that I can eat about a little less than 10 ounces per week, also known as about two cans of tuna per week. However, I have to be very cautious because if I want to eat albacore tuna, this has a higher level of mercury in it, and I cannot safely eat even a whole can of tuna or five ounces without overdoing my weekly allotment. Now, I'm not saying that if you eat more than one can of tuna a week that you're going to get mercury poisoning right away. However, you're more likely to show symptoms than someone who does not eat tuna every week. So just an interesting fact. So now we're going to get to those fancy science terms like bioaccumulation. So bioaccumulation is a process by which toxic chemicals and other material are absorbed by organisms at rates greater than what they can be eliminated. Now these chemicals are stored in animals' fatty tissues. So as a young fish that has just hatched, they likely haven't come into contact with many of these toxic chemicals, so they have very low contamination levels. However, as the fish grow older and bigger throughout time, they are going to increase in the amount of toxic chemicals in their body because they're going to start eating more and more things, right? A fish that has been newly hatched will not have had as much contact with toxic chemicals and will be, in a sense, cleaner to eat than an older fish that has more contact with those toxic chemicals and has absorbed more of them into their fatty tissues. So bioaccumulation is looking at how much toxin has accumulated in an animal over time, but just a single animal. So as an animal is now accumulating these toxins and building them up, and then something else is going to eat them, 
we now have to think, what part of the food chain is most affected by this ingestion? Is it going to be more dangerous to eat my primary consumers? Or is it going to be more dangerous to eat my tertiary or secondary consumers? To answer this question, we have to look at biomagnification. Now, biomagnification is the increasing amount of a chemical in the tissues of organisms at higher levels in a food chain or food web. So as we can see here, PCBs, these are toxic chemicals that are produced in our gases from fossil fuels. As those go into the air and into our water system, phytoplankton are going to absorb them. Now, phytoplankton are fairly small. They're only maybe going to absorb one piece each. However, my zooplankton are a lot larger and they're going to eat my phytoplankton. So they might need to eat two or three phytoplankton in order to stay happy and healthy. This means that they are going to have a higher percentage of toxin in them. And the same thing is going to happen when I have my herring here. So my herring may have to eat dozens of my zooplankton in order to be happy and healthy. So they are now going to have exponentially more toxin in their body as well. The same thing is going to now happen for my salmon. Say my salmon need to eat two herring in order to stay healthy and happy. This means that they are now going to have double the amount of toxin in their body than what a single herring has because they have to eat two of them. And then lastly is my orca or my large mammal at the end of my food chain. They are going to have the highest amount because they're going to have to eat multiple of my salmon here and they're going to now double, triple, or even quadruple that amount of toxin based on how many salmon they have to eat. So the important thing that I want you to remember here is that as we move higher up the food chain, more toxin is built up in that animal's body. So it's actually more dangerous to eat an animal from higher up in the food chain. Now this is an explanation talking you through biomagnification and how it works and how the toxins build up. However, instead of reading this out to you, I'm going to show you how this is done with a demo. All right, so in this demonstration, we are going to be looking at a simple food chain happening in an ocean environment. So here we have our producers in my tiny little cupcake cups, and this is phytoplankton. These are kind of like little tiny microscopic organisms that harness the sunlight and make their own food, very similar to a plant. Next up, we have our primary consumer that's going to eat my phytoplankton, and that is our krill. They're kind of like mini shrimps. Secondary consumer is our panfish, and that's going to eat my krill. And then tertiary consumer is my tuna, that's going to eat my panfish. And then my quaternary consumer is my human, which is going to eat my tuna. Now, in this environment, we are going to be looking at how toxins build up in a process called biomagnification. So we're going to say hypothetically that there has been a toxin spill, let's say mercury, in our water and how it's going to affect our ecosystem. So very first thing is my producers, my phytoplankton, are going to consume some of that mercury, usually because they take in food and water through their bodies and this is also going to become absorbed as well. So we're going to say that they each absorb one piece of mercury. All right, so now obviously my producers, my phytoplankton are not going to just happily swim for the rest of their lives in our ocean. Some of them are going to get eaten. Now my krill are a lot larger than my phytoplankton, so they might need to eat two or three of my phytoplankton in order to stay healthy. So in this example, we're going to have each krill each to eat two phytoplankton.
All right. So now you can see that each of my krill here have two pieces of mercury each. You can already see biomagnification happening. Each, as we get higher in the food chain, that level of contaminant or toxin is higher. Now, same thing's going to happen for my panfish, right? They're a lot larger of an organism, so they're probably going to need to eat two krill for every one panfish. All right, so now if I were to eat a panfish, I would be absorbing four units of mercury rather than if I was just eating krill and getting two. Same thing's going to happen for my tuna now. They are going to probably have to eat two panfish in order to be happy and healthy. And so now you can see that my tertiary consumer has about eight units of mercury each. And so as a human, maybe in your day-to-day -day life, you're not going to eat one can of tuna. Maybe within a week, you're gonna have two. And you can see that as we get higher and higher up the food chain, the human now has the highest amount of toxin in them, right? This doesn't always have to be a human. It could also be another top predator like a polar bear or a tiger, but it's just showing that as we get higher and higher up our food chain, the higher amount of toxin level is also going to be present in that organism's body. Now, biomagnification doesn't just happen in our oceans or in our forests, it also happens to humans as well. Just like in the demo, how this impact impacted the human, which was the big bowl, it can also impact people fairly close to where we live. Just over in Grassy Narrows First Nation, which is about 80 kilometers north of Kenora, this is actually happening. Now, if any of you have gone to Kenora or been in North Northwestern Ontario at all, right, that's where I grew up. So this is a situation that is near and dear to my heart, and I really enjoy talking to students about this. So Grassy Narrows is an area that had a pulp and paper mill just downriver from them about 50 to 60 years ago. And while this pulp and paper mill was present, they were accidentally contaminating their water with mercury. They were dumping it inappropriately. And now that mercury is still there in their ecosystem 50 years later. Now, slowly over time, fish and biomagnification have caused the animals in the area to now also have mercury in their bodies. And because the community of grassy narrows relies heavily on those fish for meals, they are also presenting symptoms of mercury poisoning. Almost 90% of their community members have some symptom of some type. Now, grassy narrows has been fighting for clean water since they found out about the mercury poisoning and are still trying to make the government aware of their crisis. So right now they are actually bringing in water from Kenora, which is a fairly long drive right now, and or in order to have clean and healthy drinking water. They also can't eat any of the fish that they could have caught in the rivers or in the lakes, which also prevents them from having good and fairly decently priced meat and suppers. Now, if you want to hear a little bit more from the people who are actually living through this, this is a video link to the people of Grassy Narrows who have made a video about their situation and what they've been living with. Now, I want you to think about this situation and think to yourselves, would it be easy to remove that mercury? And what kind of challenges would they face? Now, of course, with any amount of money and hard work, it would be possible, and scientists have discovered that it would be possible to remove most of the mercury. However, it will be fairly difficult because it's been there for so long. Since it's been there for 50 years, it has had time to leach into the ground, into, into other areas, so it would take quite a while to find where that mercury is and to extract it out. All right, everybody. I hope you are having a great day, and please feel free to email me if you have any questions on biomagnification and bioaccumulation and what the differences is between the two. All right, bye-bye.